But this man is a man of God. We're glad every time he comes to the Pentecostals of Alexandria. He's an evangelist by calling, by heart, and by choice. Only because of salvation. Because there is a Christ. We talked about it today. He said, I would never do what I'm doing if it wasn't for Jesus. But because of Jesus, it's by calling and by choice, propagating the gospel of man we love. For the Lee Stone King, would you welcome him? Thank you, Anthony. Praise the Lord, everyone. What a wonderful spirit is in this house tonight. What wonderful and great and noble people are on this platform. The Mangans are a constant stream of inspiration to all who ever come within the hearing of their voice or pick up the literature that they have read. I want to read to you tonight from the greatest piece of literature ever given to the hands of man, the Bible itself. From the Gospel of John, chapter 19, just two verses of Scripture. And while you're finding the scriptures in 19, verses 23 and 24, I simply want to say tonight that in view of all you stand for, in view of all that has happened here, and in view of all that will happen in the days that lie ahead, in the very near future, I want to leave you tonight with this message. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 23 simply says, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it or tear it, but cast lots for it. Everyone say gambling. Let us gamble for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. I simply want to entitle this tonight, I want to gamble it all. Would you lift your voices and your hands and your hearts? The very deep, the very deep of your human spirit. And would you talk to God for just a moment? Lord Jesus, tonight I pray for the wonderful touch of your spirit. Draw near to us, O Master of the universe. Let great contrition of spirit, let the convicting hand of God rest mightily upon us tonight. Take the scales from our eyes. Cause the drawing power of the world to become obscure, obsolete, O oh Lord, and vanish in the shadows, O oh Lord, as the glorious light of the gospel comes in upon us tonight. Anoint these lips of clay, cause me to speak as the oracle of the Lord. We will not fail to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. We ask these things in Jesus' blessed and wonderful name. Someone, Jesus, is going to be touched tonight. Someone is going to be helped. Someone is going to be lifted. Someone's going to be rescued. Someone's going to be delivered. Be delivered by an old, old story. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Would you clap one more time and just loosen yourself in the presence of the Lord. They tell us that there are over 70 million gamblers in the United States of America. The cost or the price of gambling in the United States of America is in the multi multiplied billions of dollars. The cost of gambling in this country annually exceeds the total cost of education plus all health care programs plus all religious activity in the United States of America put together. In fact, there is something they now call gambling junkies. In 1979, gambling was declared to be a sickness. And they say that there are some of those that are so sick with this desire that they are now termed as compulsive gamblers. They say the urge is so severe that people who are involved with this kind of an illness 
will write bad checks to buy a sandwich, throw the sandwich away, take the change, and go to the racetrack. A man who makes $30,000 a year at a job will spend $60,000 a year gambling. Some have used credit cards to cover the cost of their sickness. The average gambler in this country makes $43,000 a year, but he will spend twice that much. What causes a person to gamble? They say there are no known pat answers, but all gamblers have the same characteristics. I want you to hear this tonight. All gamblers have these characteristics. They are highly energetic, vigorously active, competitive, competitive, remarkably athletic. They are bright. They are people destined for success at a young age. There's a treatment center in Maryland. I am told that over 40,000 people pass through there annually. These compulsive gamblers go there to get help. And the goal of this treatment center is to somehow try to substitute a behavior for the gamblers which will cause them to find something as stimulating as gambling was for them in their lives. What is the sin of gambling? In the Old Testament there are prohibitions against many things. But gambling is associated with the vilest, the worst vice of the human heart, greed. Taking the children's bread and spending it at the races. We tonight are against gambling. We are against gambling. We are against gambling. In Bible college they taught us against it because it is associated with the basest of men. It is associated with murder and corruption. But I want you to take note tonight from the scriptures that I read here. Can you honestly understand? Can you possibly fathom? Can you bring yourself to believe that at the foot of the cross they were gambling? At the foot of the cross there was a gambling taking place. But really, people, there were two games going on at Calvary. In the dust, in the dirt, below the cross, there were the vilest of men, the basest of men, and they were gambling for a piece of cloth, simply a piece of cloth. But there was a game, there was a game above their heads, and the stakes were extremely high, for it was being played, it was being played. It was a man, may I say it, who was betting his life for the cause of humanity. The men at the foot of the cross, they played the game. They were a brutal men, if I may say it that way. I don't know which was worse, their brutality or their insensitivity. That they could be interested in a piece of cloth while the man was writhing in pain above their heads, held to a piece of wood by ugly rough spikes. I don't know tonight which was worse, their brutality or their insensitivity to the agony of a man who was dying above their head, that they could emotionally disconnect themselves from the scene that was behind them and become genuinely interested in the tossing of dice for just a piece of cloth. But the game that was played above their heads was played that men might be saved. Someone wrote a poem and said, and sitting down they watched him there, the soldiers did, while they played with dice. He made his sacrifice and died upon the cross to rid God's world of sin. He was a gambler too, my Christ. He took his life and threw it for a world redeemed. I wonder tonight, I really wonder tonight, if gambling isn't the perversion of some God-given instinct that all men have. A powerful instinct to risk themselves, their possessions or whatever for something great. Our instincts here tonight are basically good. They are given to us by God. There's hunger, for example. There's thirst, for example. There is desire to excel, for example. There are all kinds of instincts and emotions and feelings within the bosom of a human heart and frame. 
There are instincts and these instincts can be channeled in the right direction and they can be good but they can also be evil. It's like a piano. It can be played at Carnegie Hall by masterful fingers, fingers or it can be played in a bar room. Is it possible that gambling is the degrading, the sinful misuse of some noble instinct in man? I want you to listen again to the characteristics of those who are caught in this vice. They are highly energetic, vigorously active, competitive, remarkably athletic, bright, people destined for success at a young age. I wonder if gambling is not the perversion of some God-given instinct that just wants to throw it all, that just wants to give it all, that wants to risk it, that there's something in man that believes he can excel above that which he is and that he can strike it rich as it were in this present life. Jesus man said that man should lose his life that he might save it. If any man should save his life or use it for his own good, he would lose it. Someone said a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. It seems to me that the men of God whom we read about in the word of God were willing to take risk to get the two in the bush. They weren't content with the one in the hand, but they wanted the two that was in the bush. Gambling is not the right word for it. It's not the right word for it. We'll call it faith. I think that's better. But even though the terminology may not be correct, what is important is that there is something in you that wants to risk it all. There is something in you and there is something in me that can only be filled when you are challenged. There is something in us that cannot live in mediocrity. There is something in us that cannot survive in just a realm of mediocrity. That's why we've got what we've got going on in this world. Mankind is desperately trying to find something that will satisfy. He's trying to find something that will get, he can give himself to and religion has failed him religion has failed him and people we are beyond the days of mediocrity we can no longer have mediocre, mediocre services we can no longer just come to church and go through the motions it's not enough it's never been enough something has really got to happen when we come here something has really got to take place when we come in the sanctuary of the Lord we have somehow got to touch that realm we've got to touch that domain where something happens every time we come to the house of God can you hear me can you hear me above the clapping can you hear me above your own shouting there is a groaning inside of me there is a groaning inside of us there is something that has got to happen for us in this hour that has never ever happened before I was talking to Anthony last night uh, and I made some comment about this church. Uh, he said, Brother Stone King, we don't have a great church. Uh, we have a good church. Uh, he said, we don't have a great church. Uh, he said, nobody will have a great church in this country until it becomes apostolic. Uh, what he was really saying is, uh, there's no such thing as a great church uh, until the eyes of the blind are opened uh, and the lame walk uh, and the deaf hear and the dead are raised to life again. There is nothing to brag about. There is nothing to get excited about uh, until we reach that particular domain. For it is written in the word of God that these signs shall follow them that believe. And something is trying to come in upon us as a movement that has never ever swept in upon us before. Like it is in this present hour. Would you clap again? Would you worship the Lord tonight? For just a moment. Would you let your voice out? Would you cry to God? I want something to be born here tonight. I want God to speak to your heart tonight. That you as an individual, that you as a conglomerate body of the Lord Jesus Christ will never be the same. That miracles will begin to happen here on a regular basis. That they'll begin to happen everywhere on a regular basis. Do we not claim to be a counterpart of Acts 2.38? Do we not claim to be a part of that group that stumbled out of the upper room? Don't we say that we belong to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Don't we claim Jesus as the Messiah for our soul? Don't we claim the apostolic ministry for our hands and for our lips and for our people and for our children and for their children? Is it not written that these signs shall follow them that believe? I'm a believer. I wish I had a voice to scream it, to scream it in the streets, to scream it until the whole countryside could hear. I am a believer. I am a believer. I am a believer. I am a believer. I'm a Book of Acts believer. I'm a Bible believer. I'm really a believer. I really do believe it. I really do believe this. 
Oh, clap again if you can and lift your voice again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gambling is not the right word for it. Faith is better. The Bible says by faith Abraham went out not knowing whither he went. A farmer puts seed in the ground. It's a risk. He doesn't know what really is going to happen. It's a gamble. Marriage is taking a risk. It's a gamble. You make preparation for it. You study. You look toward 15, 20, 25 years down the road, hoping, trusting, gambling that the person will be faithful. For better or for worse, we say, it's a risk. For richer or for poorer, it's a risk. In sickness and in health, it's a risk. Abraham went out not knowing whither he went, and he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. It is time to take a risk. It is time to get involved with risk like we have never ever thrown ourselves into it before. A man has gone over the spirit of the centuries for the past 400 years. He says in the 17th century, he says the 17th century was a noble century. He said men were willing to risk. He said there were reformers who knew that John Huss had been burned at a stake, who knew that Savonarola had been young and then burned, that the Albigenses had been burned and killed from one end of France to the other, that the Walden Seas had been horribly persecuted. They risk it all. They risk it all for a story. They risk it all for a message. They risk it all. I've read accounts of where they took those people who would not denounce their faith in Jesus. Christ. Oh, there was a religious element. Yes, there was a religious element. There always has been, always will be. But the religious element condemned the supernatural and they condemned the moving of the Spirit of God. They condemned the real truth that there has always been. There will always be because it is written He left not Himself without a witness. There's always been a bunch of us somewhere in the world. There's always been a little handful of us somewhere in the world. There's always been a flicker of a flame. There's always been a flicker of a flame. But that flame is beginning to burn bright tonight and as I said this morning you can hear the crackle of cloven tongues of fire you can feel and hear the rushing mighty wind you can hear the beginning of the deluge of the latter rain there's a storm on the horizon we don't have much farther to go we don't have much longer to wait the thing we've lived for prayed for believed for is here upon us the thing is coming it's upon us it's upon us it's upon us it's upon us it is upon us it is upon us it is upon us the latter rain is upon us us. Hallelujah. Would you lift your voices? Would you lift your hands? Would you cry out to God in this house tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've read accounts where they took the men and they tied them in chains and they dangled from them from the end of poles and they, they would let them down into the fire and they would lift them out of the fire. They would let them down in the fire. They would lift them out of the fire. They actually roasted Christians alive during the persecution years. They actually roasted them alive while thousands of people watched they took the women and children they tied their hands behind their backs and they held them under water until they drowned such was the plight of the Walden Seas such was the plight of the, of the others who suffered I read one account of a man that after the persecution was over he came back and admitted he had denounced Jesus Christ and with the hand that had signed the oath that he resisted and did no longer believed in the gospel as he had preached it that man came back and with the hand that had signed the document of denial for the truth he held that hand in the fire until it burned to a crisp and fell off in the fire and church history says that hundreds yea hundreds were converted 
when they saw such a thing before them. People, I'm here to tell you tonight, there has been a noble century. There has been an era in human history when men and women were willing to risk it all, when they were willing to give it all, when nothing mattered but what they wanted. They could see something. They could feel something. How much more should we in this hour? How much more should we in this hour? How much more should we stand and risk it all? Luther before the princes and dukes of Europe said, God help me, I can do no other. Here I stand, God help me. In the 17th century, men sailed around the world to discover new lands. It was a noble century. Men and women died for what they believed to be right. They refused to follow the political leaders and the crowds of their day. But there were individuals who left their mark on human history for all the eons of time. But in the 18th century, men began to talk about reason. In the 19th century, man began to talk about economics. And in the 20th century, man is talking about security. He's willing to hold a job for most of his life to get a monthly pension at the end. In religion also, there is a desire to take a risk. In religion, there is a desire to take a risk. There are people right here tonight on these pews, many of you, especially young people here tonight, that there is something about you. You are so frustrated. You are so frustrated because motivation without direction is frustration. You come to these glorious services. You hear it preached. You see a lost and dying world. You have dreams in the night. You have visions in the church house. You feel the touch of God. You hear his voice. Angels visit you in the course of your daily living. And you don't know what to do with it. You don't know what to do with it. And you are frustrated. So you come here again tonight. Who would know? Who would know what God would do for the person who would take his life and say, I cast it all, I throw it all at the feet of Jesus. Here I stand, here I kneel, here I sit, here I lie. Do with me exactly what you want to do with me. Not my will, but thine be done. Take everything away from me, but your spirit. Don't ever take your spirit away from me. You can have my goals, you can have my future, you can have my dreams dreams but give me Jesus I've got to have it I must have it I want to see it I want to live in it oh come on you can do better than that because God God is speaking to some of you in this place tonight there is a frustration there is a longing in some of you I've been watching your faces I've been watching your faces since I came in here tonight and this morning there is something in some of you that wants to do something but you don't know what to do you don't know what to do or how to get started I'll tell you how to get started is to somebody beside you just take a hand and lay it on them that's how you get started that's how you get started that's how you get started. You just lay a hand on somebody. That's how you get started. That's how you get started. And you open your mouth and you say in Jesus' name. You say in Jesus' name. You say in Jesus' name. That's how you get started. For these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. In my name. In my name. you never be the same may you never be the same is it happening yes but I'm not satisfied I am not satisfied a marvelous miracle took place in Okima Oklahoma in November of this past year there was a man who came to a conference while I was preaching it was my th second year there my, th my second year there the last year the door was open to the gifts of the Spirit but this year they walked through the door and there's a difference. 
And there was a man who came, and this man was crippled. He had been badly, badly injured in his back. He was hardly able to walk. And he came with his wife. They were sort of 40-ish, probably in their early 40s. He sat about where you are seated here tonight. He had a teenage son, maybe more children, but that's all I saw. He had about an 18-year-old son, a handsome boy. His wife was attractive. Here came this family with this man that was crippled who could hardly walk. I'm attracted to people like that and each night I was there I would go to him and I would shake his hand and I would try to transmit some kind of goodness some kind of hope to this man to let him know that I cared that there was somebody in this world that really does care the man was a nice looking man he didn't stand when we stood he didn't raise his hands he couldn't get involved because of his condition he was there the first night he was there the second night and he was there the third night and there was standing room only the place was jammed and God told me to work with the faith concept that night and I did work with it and somehow or other with a cordless mic I found myself in the proximity of this man and without thinking I spun around and I grabbed him by his hand and I yanked him to his feet and I simply screamed you are healed in Jesus name <clears throat> that's what it takes that's really what it takes it somehow takes just cutting your head off with all the reason and the logic. Get rid of all your thinking and all of the analysis. You know why I like church services upside down? I'll tell you why I like them upside down. Noses running, frequent seizures, all kinds of stumblings, rumblings around, rolling over on the floor. You're blowing your nose and tears are streaming. You know why I like that? Because when you get like that, you're in line for a miracle because you have cut your head off. You have said goodbye to reason you've said goodbye to logic and you're leaning back in the presence of God you're leaning back in him and you are carried along on the waves of the glory of God and you don't think about how it's going to happen if it's going to happen should it happen you just let it happen you just simply let it happen and that's what we need to do is just simply let it happen ah, hallelujah ah, hallelujah when I yanked the man to his feet, he fell into me. He just stood and fell into me. I slipped my hand around his waist and his back, and I pulled him in the aisle. When I pulled him in the aisle, I'm not exaggerating. The man took off, and he began to walk. He just began to walk. And when he began to walk, his boy came out of the pew behind him. The boy went crazy. The boy absolutely went crazy. He was like a jackhammer. We could not control him. I didn't want him to knock his father down, but the boy was berserk with happiness. He was yelling and screaming. I mean, I'd never seen him act like that. He'd been pretty quiet till now. That's why we need a miracle. We need a miracle to loosen some of you. To loosen some of you. <laughs> The man walked down front, and when he got down front, he fell out on the carpet, and he lay there and spoke with tongues for one hour and 20 minutes because I timed him. I came by and laid hands on him to help him. He was oblivious to me. He was so wrapped up in his world with Jesus, he didn't even know I was there. He didn't even know I laid hands on him. Other preachers came by, laid hands on him. Saints came by. He was oblivious to us all. He just stayed in contact with Jesus. He was rejoicing. He was speaking with tongues. He was shaking and trembling. But he never came out of it for me or for anybody else that prayed for him. And so I left him there and went back over here. In a little while, there was a big explosion down front. After about an hour and 20 minutes in that altar service, I looked down front, and this man had gotten to his feet, and there he was dancing before the Lord. And as he danced before the Lord, the people had never seen a miracle like that, and they just sort of went crazy like the boy had gone crazy. But suddenly the man stopped, and he went over and got his wife, and he pulled her down front, and they began to dance together. And when that began to happen, the power of God began to sweep through that place they stopped again he picked his wife up by the waist he held her above his head and began to dance in circles and when he did that the place went nuts if you'll pardon the expression the people went nuts they went crazy because I'm telling you today that there is a Jesus there is a Jesus that is just as real just as alive as he ever was <clears throat> just as real 
just as alive as you read about in that old book. He's just as real. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He's like that here tonight. He is like that here tonight. He is like that here tonight in this house. Do you want to clap? Do you want to shout? Do you want to worship? Do you want to believe? Do you want to expand your mind? Do you want to expand your heart? I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I will never be content. I can never be content until we get it in our ranks on a regular basis. I will never stop. I will never stop until we get this on a regular basis in our ranks. Because that's where we've got to get to. That's where we've got to get to. That is our goal. That is our goal. At that point... There was another man that came hobbling down the aisle on a cane. He was in excruciating pain, was unable to walk. He came down the aisle with his presbyter weeping and crying with his hands raised behind him. That man got to the front. He threw his cane down. I picked it up and began to wave it. And the man took off dancing and shouting. Alexandria, if you ever get it going here just once, if it ever happens here just really once or twice, you've got it for the duration until we hear the sound of the trumpet, until we hear the sound of the trumpet. If you ever get it going, it'll never stop. You've got everything else here. You've got the music. You've got the instruments. You've got the talent. You've got the preaching. You've got the greatest. You've got it all. You've got it all. They get the Holy Ghost by the dozens. They've got missionaries all over the world from here. Home missionaries. Foreign missionaries. But there's one thing we need to get a hold of in this place. That is signs, wonders, and miracles. we got to have it here. we got to have it everywhere. We've got to have it here. And God's depending on you. God's depending on you. God's depending on you. Jesus! Yes, 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 there is a desire to take a risk, a desire to gamble as it were, a desire to cast it all. Someone has said that religion is betting your life that there is a God. Some have bet there wasn't, you know. The dying words of some infidels. I would gladly give $150,000, said Charteress, to have it proved there is no hell. Hobbes said as he was dying, he, he bet his whole life that there was no God. He risked everything believing that there was no God. But when he was dying, he said, I am taking a fearful leap into the dark. I am lost, 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 cried infidel Adams when dying. I am damned, damned, damned forever. His agony was so great that he tore his hair from his head as he passed away. Oh Christ, oh Lord Jesus Christ, cried Voltaire. I must die abandoned by God and men. For his condition had become so frightful that his infidel associates were afraid to approach his bedside. After he passed away, his nurse said repeatedly, For all the wealth of Europe, for all the wealth of Europe, I would never want to see another infidel die. For all the wealth in Europe, I would never never want to see another infidel die. When K 
Kay was dying, he cried, hell, 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 with a terror which no pen can describe. It was more than his family could endure, and they fled from the house until everything was quiet. Some have bet their entire life that there was no God. But Pentecost, Pentecost is betting their lives. Pentecost is betting its life. Pentecostals are betting their lives that there is a Holy Ghost. That there is a Holy Ghost. That there is really a Holy Ghost. Upon a life I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. I have staked my entire eternity. His name is Jesus. Upon a life I did not live. Upon a death I did not die. I have staked my entire eternity. His name. His name is Jesus. Over half of my life now, over half of my life now, has been bet upon the truth that there's going to be a sound of a trumpet, that there's going to be the voice of an archangel, that the shout of God one day will wake the nations that are asleep in the earth. I bet my life on it. I've staked my entire eternity that one of these days, morning, noon, or night, I may be walking along and I'll take a step and my foot will catch on the air. It'll never touch the ground again and something will begin to pull and I will begin to rise. I'll take a walk, a step, and my foot will catch on the air and I shall begin to rise. I shall begin to rise to meet him my whole life. I've staked my whole life on that. I've staked my whole life on that that there is a Jesus, that there is a God, that there is a Holy Ghost. And guess what? I found out there is a God. I know what His name is. Guess what else? There is a Holy Ghost. There really is a Holy Ghost. I got baptized in the name of Jesus. And when I did, a lifetime of sin was remitted unto me. So if that is true, then the rest of it is true. Because the same book says that suddenly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with the shout with the voice of the archangel the trump of God the dead in Christ shall rise first then we say that's me say that's me say that's me say that's me then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord I feel like clapping. I feel like shouting. I feel like running. I feel like dancing in this house tonight. Just inside the eastern gate, just inside the eastern gate, Vesta Mangan saying, tonight, I'll meet you in the morning. I'll meet you in the morning. I've staked my whole life on that. My whole life. A whole life. Carol Mangan, a whole life. Life, you have bet your life on this, this story. George Washington took a bunch of farmers in this newborn country, became the most powerful army in the world. When they signed the Declaration of Independence, someone said we had better all hang together or we will all hang separately. Nathan Hale proved that with his own life. George Washington tried to bring something to the earth that had never been before, liberty. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. In the 1990s, 
There's a cry that says, give me security or give me death. That's at the bottom of most suicides. No security can feel secure. I pray here tonight that God, God will do something, something that will say, give me some role to play, Jesus, in life that will have meaning. Don't let me live just an entity. Don't let me live and not be remembered by you or by the annals of heaven. Don't let me just exist and occupy space in this world. No matter what it costs, no matter what it takes, I want to do something for the cause of God. I want to be remembered. I want to meet, as they sang tonight, Abraham. I want to meet Isaac. I want to meet Jacob. I want to see what David looked like. But I want to see Jesus. I want to see him. I stood... It'll be two weeks ago this Wednesday night in Stockton, California before an audience of nearly 5,000 people. And there was a, a young Spanish couple, a very attractive couple, that to them was born a bundle of joy, life, a beautiful, beautiful baby girl. But this baby girl was born blind. And their desire was for this child to see Oh, people had prayed. I had prayed also before. But on this night, and I pray that this will be another night like that night. On that particular night, on this night, on this Wednesday night two weeks ago, I climbed down off that high platform and I made my way toward this couple holding this baby and the mother began to shake and to tremble and someone had to grab the baby to keep it from falling and this mother went down on her knees worshiping God, trembling and shaking and the father was shaking and trembling with his hands in the air, tears streaming down his face in the presence of the only one, namely Jesus, who can do anything about it. And I prayed for them and went off someplace else. But pretty soon I wandered back in among all these people in this massive altar service. And the father was holding the baby by himself. And I don't know why, but I just felt to do it. Say, I don't know why. Don't ever try to find out. Just do it. I went to this father and this baby on the side of the baby and I put my arms around the father and the baby and I pulled both of them in my chest and ladies and gentlemen I prayed the simplest prayer that I think I've ever prayed in my entire life it was the simplest prayer I have ever prayed I simply said Jesus I want you to open this baby's eyes for the glory of God I wasn't shaking I wasn't trembling I wasn't pounding I wasn't smearing oil I wasn't doing any of that I was just standing there catching my breath holding a father and his blind baby I opened my eyes and that baby which had been asleep opened her eyes and instead of staring off into space as it had always done those eyes rolled around and looked in my face and I knew I knew I knew God God opened that baby's eyes and the news spread like fire around the front. But by the next day, it was everywhere. On Friday night, I preached again and made mention of this blonde baby. That mother and father had that baby dressed in a small bassinet. That father held that bassinet above his head and 5,000 people stood and cheered. They stood and cheered because there is a Jesus. There is a balm in Gilead. There is still a Jesus. There is still a church. There is still a religion where the eyes of the blind mind are open and God hears the prayers. I could not help but feel compassion tonight for the prayer request of this baby. Wherever that baby is, whoever baby that is, there's a Jesus tonight that can walk in that hospital room or that house and he can extend the nail scarred hand. It is nail scarred as they sang about tonight. It's a nail scarred hand that will do the job. It's a nail scarred hand that will do the job. Could you pray one more time for that baby? Would you send an angel of God? Would you ask Jesus to go himself? Oh, come on. Lift your hands. Raise your voice. Close your eyes. Command it. (laughs) 
Deaf ears were opened that night. Deaf ears were opened that night. The Lord spoke to me and told me to have you pray for me. Your neck's going to be healed right here. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be thou healed from this automobile accident now in the name of Jesus. That's it. As easily as you feel him. Just as easily as you feel him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the pain to be gone. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus. Can you feel it? Is it going? Is it real? Does it happen? Is it alive? This Jesus, is he alive? Yes, he is alive. He is greater than a prognosis. He is greater than a diagnosis. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody like him. Oh, you ought to be on your feet and you ought to be clapping and you ought to be shouting and you ought to be worshiping God. That's it. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about right there. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. I'm not finished preaching, but if Jesus wants to heal you, then he can do what he wants to do. Lee, I want you to come here. God's going to deliver your mind, boy. You need to have deliverance in your brain. God needs to do something for your head tonight. Come a little closer. Just come a little closer. I want you to be delivered in your mind. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command your mind to clear. I rebuke this battle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yes, 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 yes. Be thou cleared out. Just be thou cleared out. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Be thou God in the name of Jesus. This hand to be healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Your mind is going to be released. It's not the will of God for your mind to be bound. I command this binding to vanish in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be thou delivered in the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ, I'll never be content. I'll never be happy. I cannot be content until we have this on a grand scale every time we come to the house of God. That's it. Can you feel those waves of glory just flowing over this place? Can you feel it just rolling from the left to the right? Can you feel it? The Holy Ghost is here for you to receive. But I want to conclude with this. There will be more healings. You'll get the Holy Ghost. But somehow I feel like you must hear this. You may stand or you may be seated. It makes no difference to me. The Bible simply says, And they crucified him. What is crucifixion? It's the central theme of our grand story. A medical doctor provides a physical description. The cross is placed on the ground. And the exhausted man is quickly thrown backwards with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrist. He drives a heavy square wrought iron nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flex and movement. The cross is then lifted into place. The left foot is pressed backward against the right foot and with both feet extended, toes down. A nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees flexed.
The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in the wrist, excruciating fiery pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrist are putting pressure on the median nerves as he pushes himself upward to avoid this stretching torment. He places the full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, he feels the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerves between the bones of the feet. As the arms fatigue, cramps sweep through the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself upward to breathe. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but not exhaled. He fights to raise himself in order to get even one small breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmatically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in life-giving oxygen. Hours of this limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-rending cramps, intermittent partial asphyxiation, searing pain as tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then another agony begins, a deep crushing pain deep in the chest as the pericardium slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. It is now almost over. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp in small gulps of air. He can feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. Finally, he can allow his body to die. All this the Bible records with the simple words, and they crucified him. Medical authorities tell us, based upon the Holy Scriptures, that when the soldier came because the Passover was nearing, the soldiers had been commanded to break the legs of those victims hanging upon the crosses so they could take them down so as not to spoil the Passover. They wanted these bodies off. And they came to the soldiers and they broke their legs. But it was written of the central figure. It was written of him that no bone should ever be broken. And when they got to him, he was already dead. And they marveled. And a soldier, I suppose, is an afterthought. Some fulfillment of duty, I suppose. He felt he must do something. He took the spear and he pierced the side. And the Bible says that forthwith came blood and water. Back to medical science and the experts, they say that there is no way for blood and water to ever collect in the pericardium or the cavity around the heart. There is no way for blood and water to ever get in there unless the heart breaks open. So then, Based upon medical modern science, we can authoritatively say here tonight that the immediate cause of the death of Jesus of Nazareth was he died of a broken heart. His heart. He opened his hands to tell us, but he opened his heart to show us he died of a broken heart. Is there anybody here tonight that would say, I want to cast it all, cast it all. I want to throw it all. I want to throw all that I am at his feet. Is there anybody here after a story like this? Are you highly energetic? Are you talented? Are you athletic? Do you have energy? Do you have a desire? I challenge you to cast it all at the feet of Jesus. Gamble it all. Throw it all at the feet. Jesus of Nazareth, you've got nothing to lose, everything to gain. If that man 
can lift his feet, lift his wife rather, and dance with his feet and cause people to go crazy. If a blind baby, through the name of Jesus, and simple words put together with human lips will open eyes and no longer stare forward but roll them around to look into the face of the one who speaks the words then there is no price too great there is no price too great there is no price too great to get into that realm how can you ever be satisfied how can any of us ever be satisfied let your voice out Go ahead and weep. There is terrible conviction in this place tonight. Terrible conviction in this house as God himself walks among his people. Oh yes, you are his people, but he's walking among you, squeezing, touching, pulling, speaking, calling. Yes. Yes. How can you ever sit there complacent, not caring? I cannot be satisfied. I want to gamble it all. I want to gamble it all. If you want to gamble it all, would you stand to your feet? Is there anybody here? would say I've sinned I've fallen short I will lower my head to the carpet I will bow my knees and cry holy would you come
everywhere, if you're not at the altar, everywhere, keep on singing. But would you all over this audience, would you close your eyes, even the far back, would you lift your hands? Would you sing it as a prayer? Would you sing it as a revelation?